Hello and welcome to EME 6429, Human Performance Improvement. I'm Dr. Tim Boylow, and in this module, I will cover an introduction to HPT and systems thinking by examining the HPT model in greater detail. We have a fair amount of information to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. By way of an agenda, We'll begin with a brief introduction to provide a bit of context for HPT. Next, we'll take some time to analyze the HPT process model and how it is used to inform the practice of human performance improvement. If you have not already completed the reading assignment for Module 1, you may want to pause, review Chapter 2, and come back, as it will make a lot more sense to you. It's important to understand the model in order to fully understand the HPT process. We will consider the three overarching principles that embody the practice of human performance technology, which are covered in the Rumler text for this week. We'll look at four general standards covering the principles of performance improvement, along with six process standards for performance technology efforts, which together represent the standards of practice for HPT, as defined by the International Society for Performance Improvement. And we'll conclude with the looking ahead slide to preview the remaining work to be completed in this module. Moving into our introduction, you should now have a context for the practice and process of HPT. Focusing on the HPT model, we can say that HPT is a process that is used to manage change. More specifically, it is about managing organizational performance improvement by facilitating change from within the organization. This requires a macro level view of the organization in order to be able to see the big picture. HPT is systemic and systematic. We use systemic integrated processes described by the HPT model combined with a systematic methodology, moving step by step to identify gaps between expected and actual performance within an organization. This leads to comprehensive analysis for the causes for the performance gap before we jump in and try to solve problems. The discipline of HPT that is embodied in the model is fully grounded in research on human performance and outcomes from each phase of the model are data-driven. When we say that HPT is model-driven, this implies a set of interrelated processes that are grouped together in phases with the stated goal of moving an organization forward in terms of performance improvement. Taking a holistic approach to performance improvement, the model guides all activity, beginning with analysis of performance to identify gaps, to understanding the causes for the performance gap, to intervention selection and implementation, ultimately to facilitate positive change within the organization. So let's take a more detailed look at the HPT model, which hopefully by now is becoming more familiar to you. As you read and saw in the text for this lesson, there are many different models which focus on different aspects of human performance improvement. The model depicted in Chapter 2 of the text shown here is fully aligned with the performance technology standards from ISPI and is the model that we use for the HPT concentration for both our program and certificate. There are two things which are immediately evident from the model. The first is performance improvement is about change management. This acknowledges that change is never easy whether it's culture, technology, business, workplace, or social change. For this reason, change management is embodied in each phase of the model. And the second is that to achieve effective long-term organizational change management requires us to focus on different aspects of the model during different phases of performance improvement. There are four phases depicted in the model, which are performance analysis of need or opportunity, intervention selection, design and development, intervention implementation and maintenance, and evaluation. Our focus in this class is on the first phase of the model, performance analysis of need or opportunity. The other phases of the HPT model are covered in EME 6426, EME 6427, and EME 6428, respectively. Within performance analysis, 
there are actually two components. The first is organizational analysis, which determines what is the desired level of performance that defines what the organization stands for. The other is environmental analysis, to assess current performance levels against the organization's mission, vision, and values. Both organizational and environmental analyses are essential to understanding the gap in performance to be addressed by the performance improvement intervention. Once the gap between desired performance and actual performance is understood, the third critical piece of performance analysis is cause analysis to fully understand and document the contributing factors causing the gap in performance. Cause analysis is based on the research and work of Thomas Gilbert, culminating in the Behavior Engineering Model, or BEM. Basically, this looks at performance in terms of two dimensions, environmental factors related to organizational supports for performance, and individual factors, which relate to an individual employee's skills, capacity, and motivation to be effective in his or her role within the organization. Taking a brief look at the other phases of the model, intervention selection, design, and development is focused on identifying the best possible interventions to achieve the desired performance improvement for this particular organization. Intervention implementation and maintenance determines how we get there in terms of achieving the performance improvement goals for the intervention. And evaluation permeates everything that we do in the discipline and practice of HBT. The four levels of evaluation, formative, summative, confirmative, and meta, are used to guide each of the other three phases of the HPT model. I mentioned earlier that the HPT model and discipline is grounded in research and theory related to human performance improvement. It's important that we recognize some of the leading theorists and authors who have helped to advance the field of performance improvement. I already mentioned Thomas Gilbert, who is considered to be the father of HPT. His major contribution is the Behavioral Engineering Model, or BEM, which provides a systemic means of assessing the organizational and individual factors that affect performance. The BEM is a widely used tool for diagnosing causes in performance gaps. Roger Kaufman is well known for his work in evaluation, as well as needs analysis. We'll be discussing Kaufman's definition of need when we get to gap analysis as it relates to creating priority matrices. Carl Binder is known for the six boxes methodology. This builds on Gilbert's BEM, providing another means for categorizing and prioritizing performance gaps and causes. Gary Rumler is the author of one of the two textbooks we're using in this class, which is Serious Performance Consulting. His research is very widely used in the practice of performance improvement. Alison Rossett is a researcher and author of several well-known books related to training needs assessment, job aids, and performance support. Her work is closely linked to front-end analysis to identify performance needs and opportunities. Darlene Van Team, Jim Mosley, and Joan Dessinger wrote the textbook used in this course and are also credited with development of the HPT model. There are three overarching principles that you should try to keep in mind as they relate to the practice of human performance technology. The first principle is that what clients think they need and what they need may not be the same thing. This was alluded to in the scenario in the assigned reading from the Rumler text. Oftentimes, a client's view of what is needed to address a performance issue is based on a partial understanding of the causes for a lack of performance. As an illustration of this, the most common performance issue cited is a need for training. It's important to understand, first of all, that training is not a performance issue. It's a solution. And training may not even be an appropriate performance intervention. As we see in the BEM, training interventions can only address knowledge and skills gaps. Related to this first point, it is human nature to focus on solutions without fully understanding the problem or causes for the performance gap. It takes discipline and experience to begin with a solution-neutral mindset in performance analysis. 
to avoid the situation of having a solution in search of a problem. This is why front-end analysis to fully understand a need or problem is absolutely critical to performance improvement, to bring in an unbiased perspective and holistic view of the entire system to fully understand the problem or gap in performance. At the same time, it is the most often overlooked step in change management. The final principle has to do with the need for systems thinking in the process of intervention selection and implementation in order to affect the desired change in performance. Disregarding the impact of the problem and or the impact of the solution on the overall system can be detrimental. We have to think of a system as being comprised of multiple components and subsystems that all work together for a purpose. A change in one part of a system affects all of the other parts the same way that a problem exists in one, that exists in one area impacts the entire system. Next, I want to spend just a few minutes to talk about standards of practice. These are published by the International Society for Performance Improvement, or ISPI, and they are also provided in a text. There are a total of 10 standards that are considered critical for guiding practice in the field of human performance technology. The first four are considered general standards. The way to remember these are with the acronym RSVP for Results, Systematic, Value, and Partnerships. We always want to focus on results in terms of performance outcomes. The, the idea of taking a systemic view as one of the general standards of practice is very important. Recall that we've discussed the role of systems thinking in the HPT model as well as in the principles of HPT. As an HPT practitioner, we want to ensure that we add value to the organization while working to build partnerships with all stakeholders. The remaining six standards of practice are considered process standards. Notice that these are closely aligned with the HPT model. First is to determine the need or the opportunity. This is accomplished through the performance and gap analysis. Determining causes and requirements is aligned with cause analysis. Determining solutions occurs during the intervention selection and design process. Ensuring solutions conformity and feasibility is of critical importance and is also part of the intervention selection and design process. Interventions must fit the culture and size of the organization, as well as the resources available. This leads to solution implementation and management. And finally, evaluate the results and their impact. Once again, please keep in mind that our focus in this class will be primarily on the first two process standards. That said, the standards of practice provide context for the HPT model as well as a foundation for the practice of performance improvement. Looking ahead, it's time to begin thinking about next steps for this module. Following this presentation, you'll move on to part three, which includes the module activities. There will be a discussion to reflect on and share your experiences with the application of HPT in organizational settings. Think about whether or not systems theory and systems thinking were employed and how that impacted the success of the intervention. Try to think about experiences that you may have had involving the implementation of performance interventions within organizations you are part of and whether the systems theory was employed. Was the intervention beneficial? If not, did it have a negative impact? I also hope to begin a conversation around the importance of systems thinking, which will be a part of everything we do in this class, and indeed everything that you do in all of your HPT classes, because it is such a critical overarching principle. And finally, be sure to complete part four of the lesson, which provides a module summary. This only takes a couple of minutes, but it's important. And next week, we'll begin talking about performance analysis, focusing initially on organizational analysis and then moving into environmental analysis. Well, that brings us to an end of this presentation. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please let me know. 
And until next time, this is Dr. Tim Boyleau wishing each of you a pleasant learning experience. And I'll see you online.